respected chairman and uh, audience let me ask permission for two or three more minutes for this topic because it's a very big topic anyhow i'll try to finish off in time so spondylolisthesis as you all know it refers to a condition of the slippage of the vertebra in the front and this has been mainly thought of because of the spondylolysis which is also a different entity where it is a non slipped parse defect that is otherwise known as a spondylolysis again this x ray shows the spondylolysis of uh, l5 and the uh, listhesis at l5 s1 then regarding the developmental uh, anatomy the parse has been uh, shown as the failure of ossification or the defect itself uh, in the juvenile period and the third theory is these small stress fractures repetitive stress fractures that fail to heal and form a chronic non union and the classification you all know meidings classification 1 to 3 4 5 4 being uh, 75 to 100% uh, 76 to 100% and the 5 is uh, spondyloctosis but what is important clinically is the low grade or the high grade that is 1 and 2 will be the low grade and 3 and 4 will be the high grade so based on that we decide on the treatment and this is the x ray showing all the four grades and what is useful classification is the combined classification of will say macnab and uh, newman whereas type 1 will be congenital and type 2 will be isthmic isthmic has three types the broken parts and the elongated parts and the third one will be the acute fracture the three will be the degenerative traumatic four and five will be the pathological here i am going to stress only on the isthmic and degenerative spondylolisthesis and this is the most easier one will say the same thing a uh, mild modification as the congenital is dysplastic spondylolisthesis i have told you i will broadly uh, categorize as isthmic and degenerative and in isthmic spondylolisthesis the repetitive cyclic loading accompanied by rotation produces a stress fracture more commonly seen in adolescent and young adults the pathophysiology is multifactorial in origin mechanical hereditary and the hormonal theory plays a major role the genetical basis is not quite uh, unknown but there is higher incidence in the near relatives mechanical both gravitational and postural forces acting upon this upright spine is the cause and hormonal in adolescents where people are more uh, exposed to hormonal challenges they have a progression of the vertebral slippage this is what is being explained which site is common in isthmic spondylolisthesis the l5 s1 is the common one for isthmic spondylolisthesis l4 l5 being 11.3 whereas in degenerative lysthesis it is l4 l5 which is quite common than the l5 s1 the symptoms the commonly these children or other adolescents with isthmic spondylolisthesis they are asymptomatic and symptomatic patients they show the symptoms the pain on extension and rotation of the spine basically the symptoms of the uh, any spondylolisthesis for that matter they are categorized into three major categories that is the back pain this is what i have told which shows an instability and the claudication pain a stenotic pain which shows a claudication pain and sometimes the root symptoms that is the radicular symptoms these are the three symptoms these are the three areas where you have to concentrate and identify what is the problem for the patient and deal accordingly So this is the clinical picture showing a flat back, a Fallon Dixon sign with the hip and uh, the knee flexed along with the flat back, and this is the arrow mark showing the step uh, uh, step sign. So now in isthmic spondylolisthesis, the step will be there between the if the say if the lysthesis is in L5 S1, the step will be there between the L4 spinous process and the L5 spinous process. Whereas in degenerative spondylolisthesis. if this if l4 degenerates over l5 then the l5 will be prominent right i hope you understand this point because clinically you will be presenting this to the examiners it depends on the isthmic type or the degenerative type in the radiological evaluation the plain x rays ap lateral most of the time they brings out the lytic defect only in 15% of the patients patient will require a oblique view which you will reveal the scottish terrier sign or the decapitated uh, dog sign this is the thing i hope you all know the parts of it and you can read in the books also 
what is important in the uh, this thing is the slip angle so the slip angle is calculated between the superior vertebral border of the body and uh, L5 and also the superior uh, aspect of S1 when the ideally it should be taken from the inferior half but usually the L5 will be trapezoidal and sometimes it may be difficult so it's better to take from the superior half superior uh, border then the slip index is regarding the uh, rounding of the slope uh, sacral uh, it is uh, used for calculation of that and regarding the MRI the MRI visualizes the parse defect and it, it defines the cause of the radical apathy whenever there is a compression and it excludes the disc herniation that is why so what you see in x-ray why should we take a go for a MRI would you like to earn from this that these are the questions asked among our own colleagues so it still it helps to visualize the past effect and defines the cause of the radiculopathy though there are certain limitations isotope study determines the age of a lysis if it is hot that is if acute lesions are there bone scan will be very useful in identifying a word about the spect the spect will, will uh, show a metabolically active uh, disease that is a metabolically active uh, lysis will be very well visualized about this spect these are the limitations of the radiology that is uh, in the lumbar spine that it, it, it shows some inability to detect the stress reactions in the pars. CT is not sensitive for detecting early acute stress reactions and MRI again direct identification of the pars defects that is old stress, stress uh, pars defects may not be visualized in the MRI and bone scans it cannot identify the old pars defect. So management, management it is regarding the grade 1 and 2 asymptomatic, grade 1 and 2 symptomatic. Grade 1 and 2 asymptomatic it is better to, uh, it is better to go conservatively by no activity modifications and avoid contact sports. In symptomatic individuals it is better again still go for conservative measures. Whereas grade 3 and 4 that is high grade spondies always they require a surgery in adolescence that is isthmic spondylolisthesis that is again the indications to summarize slip more than 50 percent are progressing in adolescence and back and leg pain unresponsive to non-operative treatment functionally significant neurological deficit cosmetic deformity still the patients may come with you with the deformity at the back not able to lie down supine in the supine position with the sore or the prominent spinous process uh, there are there have been incidences which we see and such patients are also require, may require surgery. What are the risk factors for slip progression? Young age at presentation, female slip angles more than minus 10 degrees, high grade slip and dome shaped sacrum and inclined sacrum. The surgical options we have told in parse defect it is better to do a parse repair alone when there is no progression or it is only grade 1 or 2. Fusion with or without decompression. The parse defect repairs bone grafting local bone grafting can be done and these are the methods where you can put a pedicular screw and another tension band wiring over the transverse process and you can repair the pass effect in grade 1 and 2 whereas when it gray goes grade to higher grade then we may have to go for a fusion option so that fusion option we have multiple types of fusion the posterior posterolateral posterior lumbar interbody fusion transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion and anterior lumbar interbody fusion. So the posterior is the oldest but still failure chances are more. Posterior lateral is still more effective than posterior but what is <laughs> very much superior is the posterior lumbar interbody fusion and there have been certain disadvantages of posterior lumbar interbody fusion like nerve retraction and other things. So the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion may be ideal in few cases and the anterior lumbar body interbody fusion is also there. The regarding the Bradford's criteria for reduction, reduction should we do a reduction for spondylolisthesis if at all when will you do? When the vertebral slippage is more than 60 percent, when the slip angle is more than 50 percent, 50 degrees and the symptoms are uncontrollable by operative means and the ages between 12 and 30 where still the vertebra are mobile in that in such situations uh, you the Bradford has, divided, has designed these criteria for reduction and in grade 2, 3 and 4 posterior fusion in situ removal of the loose posterior fragment that is the rattle or the opercolum they say the posterior decompression and fusion reduction and combined reduction and combined anterior and posterior fusion spondylectomy 
that is the Gaines procedure and anterior and posterior fusion. Why reduction? If it, should you do a reduction? It stops the progression of the deformity and restores the sagittal balance and uh, it produces less post-op pain, full nerve decompression, better chance of union, less fusion length, restores the body posture and mechanics and improves the appearance and self-image. What are the problems of in-situ fusion? As it is, don't reduce it. There are still supporters of this. It, it produces a higher rate of pseudarthrosis, a chance of progression of a slip, loss of motion segments, neurology deficit and a persisting deformity persists. So again that about the PLIF, the decompresses the neural canal, distracts the disc space which is very important and stabilizes the motion segments and it is better in PLIF you do only a one motion segment alone is being fused whereas if double levels are there you can go for uh, additional problems are there you can go for one more level up. So again TLIF you do not disturb the uh, ligamentum flavum and the posterior spinous process. You go along the, you do a facetectomy and go along with that and go for a fusion. Regarding the anterior interbody fusion, it is an anterior approach. When there is a poor sagittal alignment, they say sagittal alignment is well restored in the uh, anterior interbody fusion and uh, it produces a neutral kyphosis. So, this is about a picture. So, to summarize the isthmic spondylolisthesis. It is a typical parse defect which is common in the human population. Most of the people are asymptomatic and symptoms are relatively uncommon during childhood and adolescence. For low grade spondees, in situ fusion is sufficient even without instrumentation in adolescence. This has been shown in the literature. And the reduction of high grade spondees is much better to restore the global sagittal imbalance. Then comes the word of partial reduction which we are all meeting in the theatres. So we go for, we do not better not to assure any patient that you will go for a complete reduction of the spondees. In that case because most of the time we achieve a partial reduction. There are supporters of partial reduction also. The partial reduction with circumferential fusion and secure internal uh, fixation appears to be much more safer. That is fine. This is a degenerative spondylolisthesis. I will just rush and finish off the surgical options. The surgical options, again the same surgical options for digit because it is different. This is different because a long standing problem, a chronic problem of the patient especially in adulthood which produces degenerative changes and it goes for a listhesis. So either you have to see whether it is a stable slip or an unstable slip and there is an associated stenosis in this uh, degenerative listhesis. You have to identify the level of the stenosis and then you have to go for a decompression here whereas we did not decrease. Uh, tell all those things in the isthmic one. Uh, laminotomy or a laminectomy associated with fusion whether it is a posterolateral fusion or posterior lumbar interbody fusion whether it is an instrumental fusion or non-instrumental fusion. These are all very important in degenerative listhesis. whereas this also depends on patient dependent factors like young healthy individual with degenerative listhesis, elderly individuals who are active and elderly low demand individuals. So this is about a listhesis showing the root stenosis that is the foraminal stenosis, lateral recess stenosis and a listhesis. So what will we do? Here are the options. So we, shall we go for a laminotomy alone or shall we go for a laminectomy and a posterior lateral fusion? Shall we go for a posterior instrumentation, interbody fusion? Shall we also go for an additional posterior lateral bone grafting? The fusion rate and the functional outcome patients treated with decompression and fusion for degenerative spondees had improved patient reported functional outcomes. So most of the people always say laminectomy alone is enough. I have seen, I have seen in my lifetime so, so many cases operate, no not like that. The uh, fusions, those patients with instability, they always do well with the fusion. To summarize for degenerative spondees. Young, healthy, active individual, decompression and fusion with the pedicular fixation and what type of fusion depends on your hands and uh, always the interbody fusions outscores the posterolateral fusion provided you are a good surgeon doing a best posterolateral fusion following the principles you will also equally equate that uh, result. In elderly active individuals decompression and fusion is the treatment of choice. Whereas elderly low demand individuals say 70 years or so, limited decompression without fusion will be the treatment of choice. 
So this is a case that is a 55 year old lady with a lysis and associated with degeneration. So this is the MRI to see the disc with how much it is involved and in again in spondies I would like to stress that this is not the disc herniation which you should not tell in the exam it is always a pseudo disc herniation this is not a disc herniation so this is, the, this is what I would like to stress and this is the patient which has undergone a laminectomy along with the interbody fusion first of all uh, lumbar interbody fusion and supplemented viscose. This is one and a half months follow up and she is doing well. As a word about the iatrogenic spondylolisthesis, some interesting factor is the in inter anterior interbody fusion, the either the vertebra above or below develops a pass fracture that is called a uh, iatrogenic spondylolisthesis for the surgeons and uh, the laminectomy procedures which result in overload of the weight bearing stress on the contralateral parts in some patients may also result in a pass fracture and go for a spondylolisthesis. Thank you, Charon. Thank you.